Okay, thank you for inviting me here. It's the first time I come to Israel in 31 years, uh, so it's good to be back. Uh, uh, give me a second here. Um, sorry? It's, it's better for me. Um, the truth is, I'm not sure what I'm doing here because I'm not, <laughs> um, apart from coming to Israel again, but um, I don't work with the, in the NGOs. I don't do development work. I'm a researcher in biodiversity, managing a small program that is called the Institutional Learning and Change Initiative, where we essentially are looking for ways in which we can improve or find new ways of doing research that has more impact on the ground, new research frameworks. And that means new ways in which the researchers can engage with other actors in the innovation system. And that led, leads me immediately to the topic of innovation and entrepreneurship. But I don't have many practical comments as the other participants here, but more kind of um, outsider observation point of view. First of all, I think uh, when we are talking innovation in the rural areas, w so far I have, what I have been hearing is think it's quite limited in terms of the understanding of the concept. Um, w in the specialized literature, innovation essentially includes the enabling environment. We talk a little bit about that, it's the laws, the regulations, um, the technology. We talked a lot about the technology. But also there is the business model in the adopting farmer. And we didn't talk very much what the farmer is trying to do with the technology and what, how the technology fits in there. We are not talking anything about the organizational dynamics and how the farm has to adapt, not only to take the irrigation or the planter, but the whole set of activities of the farmer which I'm going to talk a little bit more about it. Then we didn't talk about livelihood strategies and we didn't talk about capacities. And I think if we don't talk about those issues, then we cannot understand um, entrepreneurship and market development and all the other things. So the first thing is, I think all the discussion, and it's not only here, but in general in the development world, in all the NGOs, the international organizations, I think the discussion is still very much technology driven. We are descendants, sons and daughters of the Green Revolution and we tend to think about the Green Revolution as the model. And it's very mechanistic in the way we think the technology moves or the market develops. The other problem I think is we are talking about the small farmer. We are not talking about the particularities of the products. So it's very difficult different if we are talking about staples that people consume, if we are talking about commodities for selling, grains that are not perishable, you can transport, or we are talking high value products that uh, you can transport, like palmitos in Costa Rica, or you are talking uh, strawberries in Mexico, which are highly perishable, you cannot move. So it's not the same when we are talking about all these different markets, and I don't think the interventions that we can talk are, can cross a can be trans uh, transported across uh, products. But I think for me the big, big issue which has been overlooked until now is this issue of the livelihood strategy. Everybody is talking about the small farmer without recognizing that the small farmer is part of a rural household that has many members and they have a diversified livelihood strategy. And agriculture is only one part of that livelihood strategy. Most families have um, a member that has migrated to a city or to the United States, Europe, uh, is working off-farm. Um, according to the World Bank, in 2010, there were 150 million international migrants. To that, we have to add all the domestic migrants, so we are talking about probably two billion. China is trying to move 300 million people out of the countryside in the next decade. And um, 
estimates for 2012 were that these 150 million uh, migrants were sending um, 500 billion dollars a year in remittances. So if we are not talking remittances, we are not understanding the dynamics of the rural household. And if we are not talking the, those dynamics, then we don't understand what they are doing. So for most farmers, remittances are today one of the big sources or of, sorry, of farm income is much larger than the agriculture uh, of, or farm the, the right income. So now we have to ask ourselves whether the farmers are really farmers or are, what is the role of agriculture in the livelihood strategy. And for many of these farmers, the agriculture is mostly a source of food. They are trying to cover their food consumption needs and sell whatever they sell, but they are not very much interested in really, really expanding their productivity or investing in producing. This is a blanket, I'm not saying that everybody's like this, but a large majority, if you ask if most small farmers in Mexico why they don't produce more maize, and they will say, because it's not a good business, and so why you produce it, so I don't have to buy. So the point is, we are talking about the small farmer without understanding what are the dynamics. We are now running a project in Congo where we are trying to introduce a new technique to control a banana disease. And the complexity of the livelihood strategies and family dynamics are so amazing that we never ever thought that we could ever understand that system without being embedded in that and working with them every single day as researchers. You know, um, we thought that you only had to go and cut a banana, but then by the bananas you have the beans, which the beans are managed by the wife, and the bananas are managed by the husband. So the wife does not allow the husband to step on the beans because he ruins her beans. So you cannot control the bananas because the, there is this family division of labor. So on the same plot, you have two different enterprises with different objectives working together. So you need to understand these issues when, before you start ask giving the farmers uh, the subsidies and inducing them to get into this new. The second thing is entrepreneurship, which is not really clearly understood, and I think this is a very, very important issue. Um, in, the in the more developed agriculture systems, they have been subject to the market uh, discipline for centuries and many, many years. You see it not only in, develop, in, developing, in developed countries. You have it in Argentina, you have it in most of Brazil. Now it's happening very strongly in Costa Rica, Paraguay. And the issue is those who are not good entrepreneurs, they have been weighed out as commercial farmers. Now, we know from the literature on gifted children, education, psychology, that most capacities have two components. One is what you are born with, and the other is what you can learn. And what you're born with is, provides a natural limit to what you can improve. So, you know, um, I'm not an entrepreneurship <laughs> entrepreneur. I'm, and we tried with my family and I failed miserably because I was, uh, you know, the, the, I was, I like to write, I like to study, I like to read, and the customers would take my time from, so <laughs> I would hate the customers. So, the, of course, that's not the way you run a business. And, uh, and it's, I don't think, it's, it's not an issue of, of, of intelligence, it's an issue of where your heart is, your interest. So, um, usually, you know, um, you cannot teach me to be a good entrepreneur. Um, maybe you know, in a few years my heart will change, but uh, I, I like to read. So, uh, and the same, you know, it's, 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 I always give the example, you can teach people to play football, but you cannot teach them to be messy. <laughs> so, um, and, uh, so, when we are now, when we are having this population, rural populations in the countries we are trying to intervene, we have what I would say is an 
non-homogeneous population but has not been subjected to a selection uh, pressure. Um, so when you have, you know, uh, when, when a new pest uh, appears, UG99, you don't know whether you are susceptible or not until you are subject, you are, you are confronted to the pest. Um, in entrepreneurship is the same. These small farmers in developing countries have been integrated into markets only recently. So what we are seeing in countries where this system has been more advanced is that only 10%, more or less, are able to make it on their own as commercial farmers in these more advanced markets. And this 10%, they, start, they become a middle class in the rural areas and they start buying or renting out land and buying uh, water uh, rights and they are providing um, employment for the other 90%. So essentially what you see is that the integration into the markets is creating these new dynamics in the society which we are not talking about. Um, I haven't seen any organ international organization, NGO, uh, university that has done a study on the asset dynamics of rural commodities have been integrated into markets. You can maybe correct me and <laughs> point me to the right. I haven't seen any. Um, there is only a few references here and there. But uh, so I would like, and I, that would be my recommendation, when you do all your market, your, your impact assessments, really focus on what's your impact on asset ownership in the rural areas when you integrate into the markets. The second problem is, and I agree with what you're saying, um, there is a lot of NGOs and, pro, and, pro, and, and, and international programs providing subsidies into the, uh, when they come. And that's really a curse. It's much more than just uh, uh, unfair competition. Um, farmers, you know, <laughs> there was an old joke in the Soviet Union uh, when everything was Russian, you know, and people had to do these long lines to get the things. And one old guy was walking and then he saw this long line and he finds a friend as old as him and he says, uh, Misha, what are they giving out? Oh, they're giving out potties, you know, like for the children, the small children, potties. And what do you want uh, potties for? You know, you're an old guy, you don't have uh, grandchildren. If tomorrow they give out shit, how do I carry it? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, the, we're seeing that in the, in the countryside, and it has very, very, very bad implications. Much, you know, we are running a program now, uh, trying to organize two small self-help groups to see how we move the te the, 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 this cutting technology for, to control the bananas. And um, one of the problems we are having is that the neighbors are jealous because they think that our farmers are getting something. One of the principles that we told them the first day is you are not getting anything from us except the technical advice on how to control the disease. And the neighbors don't believe it. Now our farmers are being afraid that they are going to be cast a spell against them. That means that they will be murdered. They will be, you know, poisoned. And so it's not small potatoes. Now we have to start organizing several other groups so that we can diffuse the jealousy in the village. Um, so I think this issue of the um, subsidies is, is much more than just the, the, the it's, it's a curse that it's transforming the whole dynamics. And the other problem with this is that we are not considering the cost of failure, which is huge when you start talking to the farmers who tried in these different um, schemes and then they fail and they end up with a shed that doesn't serve them for anything but they have to still pay for half of it. Or when they, you know, when they invested in, in in, in trees and then comes a new NGO with a new project with a new um, technology and then they have to uproot the trees to plant what they are given. And it's not only a problem for the farmers, it's a problem for us as researchers in the CGIR because we are being asked to show uh, impact. 
But then we are also in this project cycle, and in the NGOs is the same. You're going in a place with, for three years, five years, and then you move to a new project because you are expected to graduate. So you move away, and then another NGO comes with another project, with another subsidy, and then the farmers move. And the farmers on the field, they also complain about this issue. So just to be uh, wrapping up, um, the other thing I think, sorry, is, uh, which is I think it's a big, big problem, is that there is this firm belief that collective action can help the small farmer uh, thrive or become a commercial uh, entrepreneur. And um, so you see all these projects in which they push the farmers to integrate into organizations. Um, I don't remember now where, but I remember seeing a paper where the rate of failure of projects after five years after they ended was more than 90%. And the issue is because you're forcing people who do not have the capacity, the interest of being entrepreneurs into activities, into organizational modes for which they, they cannot do it. So essentially, what are the, my recommendations, maybe, or my thoughts about these issues? First, we need a better targeting in the projects. Better targeting means that we need to be able to have means in which the farmer self-select self -select who will participate in a um, entrepreneurial model or entrepreneurial activity. Then we need to provide for the 90% of those who cannot make it, the tools to integrate into a much more complex integrated world. We have to invest much more in education, in health, in training, in non-agriculture. We have to stop thinking. Everybody has to be a commercial farmer. Everybody, you know, if you have farming, plot that is as big as this and you're making a living of a garden like this, then there's no way you can make a living by even multiply, multiplying your maize yields by 10. You would still be poor, small farmer. So it's not an issue also only of productivity, it's an issue of scale. And it's only, not only an issue of scale in terms of production. If you need to market then you know there are very, very strong economies of scale in marketing, in procuring. So when you look at production as a full enterprise, you realize that most of small farmers, and I'm finishing, most of small farmers, they cannot make it as small farmers. So it doesn't mean that the small farm will disappear. The small farm has a role to play, and we need to discuss and figure out what it is and what the farmers want. They, from our side, what we are starting to advocate in the CGIR is to focus much less in productivity and much more on stability and, pest and disease control. So you can cover these food needs that the small farmers are willing or, or needing. So I think that's uh, my time and I finish here. <laughs>